We've got a nice size group here tonight. Yeah, that's what it looks like. All right, so my clock says 6 o'clock on the nose, and I like to be on time. So I'm going to start things off. First of all, I want to say for all of you that are here, thank you for joining, joining us. This is the first time you've had a chance to interact with me. I'm Lisa Payton, and I'm teaching kind of the digital marketing portion of the course that you are taking. So the next three weeks, you've got me, you've got my voice in your head um, with the videos that I put together, um, and then these live sessions, which is your chance to ask me um, a question. It can be about the materials that we've gone over for the week. Um, but more specifically, we've got industry experts that we're going to be talking about, um, talking to, and you have a chance to ask them questions as well. So just know there are no stupid questions. I know we're all kind of at different levels of uh, with marketing experience in this group. So just know that there are no stupid questions, and I want this to be a really safe space for you guys to ask whatever you feel you want um, to know. Um, I'm thrilled to have you all here. You guys are a great cohort this term. I'm super excited. I was reading all of your introductions, and it's a really great group. So thank you for being here again, and I'm excited to get started. So I want to introduce tonight, we've got, so there was a slight switch. Um, uh, typically, Alex would be going week two, but there was a conflict. So Alex is going this week, and we're going to have Tim next time. So just you know there was a little switcheroo with our schedule um, to make sure that we both experts could join us. So um, Alex is here, and he works at Anvil Media. He's a search strategist, and some of his specialties include search engine optimization, search engine marketing, social media marketing, um, and he's just a really great um, guy, and thank you, Alex, for being here. Um, so the way it's going to work tonight, everybody, I'm, I'm going to um, start kick off um, our session with some questions that I've prepared, and Alex is going to answer, and then we're going to open it up to you guys. So feel free to type your questions in the chat box whenever. You don't have to wait and sit on a question. You can type it in at any time, and when it gets to that portion of our live session, I'll just jump in and start asking your questions. So, um, so this week, Alex, so this week, um, with, it's week five in the course, but week one with me. Um, they've been work, um, learning a lot about website, um, kind of building their website, and really, you know, talking about how website is the foundation of kind of the digital marketing tree, if you will. Um, even though less and less, you know, consumers are actually visiting websites, it's still important to own your real estate on the web, um, and so you can at least kind of push people there, and then you can track conversions and whatnot. So that's what they've been thinking about this week, and they kind of their task was to find an industry website that they thought did a good job. Um, and I'm looking forward to all of you guys providing your um, your feedback on which site you chose. So let's, you know, the, the hard thing though, there is a challenge with, with alcohol and that there are some restrictions around what you're allowed to advertise online. So I wanted to start off with um, kind of if you could give us some guidelines. So I know that like Google AdWords and some and Facebook um, and some of these, pl these platforms have really kind of restrictive rules around advertising alcohol. So I wanted that to kind of be front and center here to kick things off. So um, get us started and, and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. So if you are looking to start any sort of um, paid advertising efforts, it, it's going to be very important to check out the terms and conditions about what you can or cannot um, advertise. And just as some of the examples of what you can't include, um, whether that's text or an actual image of something, uh, first of all, you can't target anything that has to do with like underage drinking, um, pregnant women, you can't actually show people drinking, and I think that even still applies with regular television co commercials. If you look at commercials for like beer, you actually never see anybody taking a sip. It's always just sort of like in their hand and they're hanging out with their friends, things like that. So that also applies with online advertising. Um, and then in general, uh, you can't also talk or show anything that has to do with um, operating machinery or driving or anything like that. So it seems it, it's mostly stuff that seems pretty common knowledge. Um, you know what you wouldn't what, what what would be against the law as well, um, but those are typically tend to be the top ones that are found on AdWords and Facebook, um, and there's really not that much um, difference between those platforms. They usually focus on these types of rules. Great. Um, so it, and the, the bad news is there are restrictions, but I think the good news is that you know with in craft work particularly, it's such a great kind of social. Um, industry that I think that there's in you know, NCSB, it's business to consumer, so I think there is a lot of opportunity um, around creating compelling advertising campaigns. Um, they just have to be mindful around restrictions. Um, let's talk about 
conversion. So this is a big piece of the puzzle, and, and co the term conversion might be new for some of you guys out there. Um, but ultimately, I know that part of the task for this week was to start thinking about a website in terms of what you want the user to do when they get to your website, which is really a conversion, right? So what, what, you know, do you, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to sign up for an email newsletter? Do you want them to buy something online? Um, and I wanted Alex to talk to us a little bit about um, conversions. We've generally, Alex, and you know what, what the important conversions are for some of your clients. And then, you know, maybe even breaking out, um, you know, I think, you know, paid versus organic and kind of how the conversions play into that because sometimes um, it can be more, there's a, more of a positive ROI for a paid campaign around certain conversions and whatnot. So give us some, some information on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think it really starts with, you know, what do you want to be able to track? And you talked a little bit about that, you know. If you um, are starting up, you know, sort of like a brewery and a brew pub, and, you know, you just want to build sort of your brand awareness, and so you're going to have an email newsletter. Uh, so getting people to subscribe to that newsletter can be a conversion. Uh, but then let's say as you grow and you start becoming popular and you have merchandise like T-shirts and hats and growlers and things like that, and you want to sell that on the website, that's another conversion process. Um, what's going to be important for measuring conversions is tools like Google Analytics, which is completely free. Um, and so when you have your website and you have Google Analytics, you can create those goals um, that would be conversion points. So it's either um, a goal would be considered, uh, so if I'm going to fill out a form to subscribe to an email, when I click submit, um, either you're tracking every time that somebody clicks on that submit button, or when they click submit, they're taken to like a thank you page or a, a receipt page um, if you were to purchase something. So a click on that button or a visit to that thank you page would be the, the, the action that triggers the goal to register. Um, so you can do that within Google Analytics, and it's fairly easy to set up. And what's great is when you set up these goals, or even more complex, if you actually have the, the e-commerce option on your website, you can track sales and revenue and all that information as well through Google Analytics, is you can end up finding out, okay, so I had 100 visits from organic search, or I had 100 visits from Facebook, and um, 10 of those ended up converting. So you can get a sense of where conversions are coming from, um, what sort of conversion rate, so how, how, what percentage of people are actually converting on that action. And you can actually help, help uh, inform yourself about, okay, this is what's going on with our site. And so if you're not getting a lot of action, that might help you make some decisions about, okay, we need to change this approach or this look uh, or this usability on our website. Um, if you're going to go with some social platforms like Facebook, for example, Facebook has uh, some goal tracking uh, features as well so that you can set up uh, a separate tracking code just for Facebook ads that you might run. So depending on what platform you have available, Google Analytics, which is free, it's pretty uh, ubiquitous, that's going to be your uh, most likely option. But something like Facebook has tracking as well. Great. And, you know, I, I think most of the, the folks that are in the course, um, a lot of them, they, they want to start their own brewery or brew pub. And I think a lot of it, um, uh, there's this element of local, kind of local traffic. Um, and, you know, so, so local is important. And they may not necessarily be selling, you know, their primary profit might not be from online merchandise, right? But maybe it's from actually getting people to come in. So, but there, I think that there, it's important to understand there are still, you know, conversions or even micro conversions, you might call them, that happen online that can help bring that foot traffic in. And maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Like, you know, I mean, for example, um, I'm thinking of events, right? So if you have an, an event, um, I know, like, I, Facebook, I just read an article, is still a pretty compelling place to start promoting events because a lot of people, unless everybody's on Facebook and um, having an online element to your event can get more people there. They share it with friends and you're so social that you can actually grow your numbers pretty significantly that way. Yeah, so if you're running, like, a particular event, um, having that event page on Facebook can be a great way to see how many people um, you invite or, you know, even Google+. Plus. If you have a Google Plus page, um, you can have events that way. If you're, you know, if you're going to be sort of like um, in the door, you know, if you're going to have an actual brew pub type restaurant and you want to get people in the door, that that side of local search, there's some ways to sort of track that performance as well. So if you have a local business and you're trying to drive traffic through the door, um, you're most likely going to have um, a Google Plus local page, so the local business listings 
um, and a Yelp page as well. And so if you have verified profiles on Google Plus Local or on Yelp, um, you're going to have some insights that you get access to. And, uh, for example, with the Google business listing, you can see how many people um, viewed the, the business listing. You can see how many people initiated driving directions which may not be able to actually track the user once they get through the door, but if more people are trying to find out where you are and find your phone number or find your address to, to get to the, to the restaurant, that's an indication that you're being successful. And Yelp has some of those same features as well. You can see how many people viewed the Yelp page, they might have viewed the menu, um, clicked on the map to find directions, or, or clicked on the, the phone number to, to call and see when you guys might be open or take reservations, that type of thing. So uh, the local tools like Google Business Listing and Yelp, um, they've got some, some features that give you insights. Awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about paid search. So um, you know they were we kind of went over the the digital marketing ecosystem in, in this week's lecture, um, and I know that you're really kind of a pay, an anvil, and you are kind of really um, on the cutting edge of paid search. So I do want to um, you know kind of give the students an overview, and I think that you know sometimes there's a mis so first of all when I say paid search, typically we're talking about Google AdWords. I mean Google AdWords really kind of owns if you will, there's Bing and Yahoo, um, and then there's like a lot of social paid, but really AdWords, when you kind of talk about um, the active buyer, if you will, you know, who are putting in the keywords into Google, that's typically, I think, what you're talking about. But I think sometimes there's a um, kind of this, this idea that it's sort of easy, right, that it's easy, like, oh, I'm just going to, how many times have I heard a client say, oh, I'm just going to go in and you know, set up an AdWords campaign and just get this thing running, and I'm here to tell you it's not easy, like, it's really not easy, and I, and I think, um, I would love, Alex, for you to just talk a little bit about like all the things that go into really putting together an effective paid search campaign. Could you kind of go into that? Yeah, so I think first and foremost, it, you really have to have a good understanding about what your, who your audience is and what your goals are going to be. Um, if, if you're going to have, let's say for like a distillery, for example, and um, you might, at, at first, you might just be um, distributing your bottles to other liquor stores. Um, if you were to get through to OLCC, for example, um, you know, that might be more about brand awareness because you might not have an open, pub, you know, public facing door that people can come in and brew the, or um, visit the distillery or purchase bottles directly from you. So it, Depending on you know what sort of stage you're at in business, it might just be brand awareness. But let's say you get to a point where you actually have a brew pub and you want to start driving traffic, um, that's where you're going to go more into those local business listings to see how well that that is performing. Um, and then also you know you can use paid advertising platforms, like Lisa said, to maybe drive awareness around a particular event that you might be focused on. Um, or you know e-commerce with with merchandise sales. So you really have to know your audience um, and what platforms they're on, such as like Untapped, which is great for beer, um, and what your goals are. So what what do you want to accomplish? Yeah, and you know another um, a question I get a lot, Alex, and I would love to get your perspective on this is sort of um, this the concept of having a branded paid campaign, right? So. Um, you know, when you talk about brand awareness, and for some of these smaller kind of craft breweries, I think brand, having your brand name get out there is really important, um, especially because they're, you know, it's such a hot industry right now, and there are a lot of people out there who might very well be searching for the local craft breweries in Delaware, you know, or, or somewhere out there, um, and making sure that your brand shows up. So then it's kind of a two-part question. So. First of all, if you're newer and let's say you have a, a, a brand term that's a little bit more common, so let's say you're not showing organically for your brand term, you know, how important is it for you to run then a branded search campaign? And then the second thing, I, obviously, and then there's the whole idea of the non-branded. So what I, the example I was just giving, if someone doesn't know your brand name and is looking for a craft brewery in Delaware and it's somewhere, um, then, you know, that next stage of making sure that you're showing and uh, kind of above the fold for that term, and you know, so I guess it's kind of a two-part question. I hope that makes sense. Um, that's sort of a convoluted question, but I guess brand. So brand. Start. I start with the branded branded search campaign first. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So so if you're trying to run um, some some paid campaigns just to sort of build your brand, you can certainly target um, keywords that you know somebody might know your name by chance or might not know your name. 
Um, but, you know, you might also look at some additional ways to build that. Uh, within AdWords, you have the option of building display ads, mm -hmm. which are more graphic, which you might see on, like, ESPN or something or um, your local news website. You know, you see those banner ads. You can actually build some of those and following the guidelines, of course. And then if you know your audience, let's say it's a pretty strong craft brewery market, you might be able to do a little bit of research and find some local some local uh, websites that you would think that, okay, somebody lives in this market, <coughs> excuse me, and this is these are some of the news channels in this local market, or these are some websites that this market frequents. You might be able to get some display ads shown on that website um, so that they can say like, okay, you know, this is our this is our new group hub or whatever, um, and it might even be you, you can you can get even more specific so that you're not just targeting um, Oregon Live, for example, but if you target Oregon Live on pages that talk about restaurants or beer, so you can combine the two types of targeting options. Um, another great option for just general brand awareness is. Yelp, for example, uh, one of the benefits of advertising on Yelp is that you get your ad placed on another listing. So if I am looking at one particular uh, restaurant, I might see an ad for a brewery or a distillery because it's sort of a related category, um, and it, that's going to show up on that individual business listing, and it's not going to appear, and it could potentially appear in search results as well. Um, and then a side benefit of advertising on Yelp is that nobody, no, no other businesses can advertise on your listing. Um, so you get to close off your listing, but then you might advertise on other listings that don't pay for advertising. Excellent. And, um, and you guys, thanks for putting your questions. We are going to uh, talk, I'm, I'm going to try to get to all of your questions, but Drew actually has a question that's really relevant to this conversation. So. Um, he's asking, how do you determine when paid search is effective versus when it is simply cannibalizing free or organic search? What's the best way to balance reach and efficiency? I think that's a great question. Yeah, so um, a lot of times we do get that question of, okay, does it make sense to bid on your own terms? Um, and I think one of the, the one of the main benefits that you get from it is that you actually get to control your message. Um, if you think about your organic search results, um, and you build your website and you have content um, and you might optimize that piece of content, um, you know, like the title tag and the meta description, some of those uh, basic SEO elements. Um, Google actually has the right to maybe throw that title tag away or, or have something else in there. Um, so in the end, you may not get full control, but if you have a paid campaign, for your own brand name. One, it just takes up more screen real estate, so you're just present more. But then you also get to control your message um, a lot better. So if you have a particular event, um, you can make that update a little bit more frequently in terms of those ads um, and some of the additional ad features that you get to promote updates or merchandise. Um, but then one of the things that you can do just to see if it's effective or not is test um, your traffic, running some paid campaigns for your own brand name, um, and see the results of, you know, up in your lift in traffic, your total traffic, and then organic and um, paid search. And then when you're running, when you're done running that test, you could run a test then of not bidding on your own brand name. And so you might see that organic traffic increased above what was lost from paid search, or you might see that organic search decreased and didn't make up that difference. So it really just comes down to a test as well. Yeah, I think that's great advice, Alex. And, um, you know, now, with the, you know, the, depending on the resolution of the screen and whatnot, sometimes the organic results are below the fold. Like, you don't even see the organic stuff, and you know, above the fold anymore. So, you know, it's just more and more kind of this, you know, pay-to-play environment, um, and it's really hard to get seen. So you guys are asking some amazing questions. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, go to Christian's here. Will free tools like Google Analytics be useful for helping you identify locally used websites by traffic? And I think, are you asking um, how, and I think this is what you're asking, Christian, or how you can identify um, websites where you might want to advertise on, so local websites? I think that's how I would read that question. 
Alex, want to take a stab at that one as he's saying yeah. it? Yeah, so um, Google Analytics is going to measure the traffic that is coming to your website. So you might be able to see if there is a locally relevant website that is sending traffic towards to, to you. So you may not be aware of it, but as your brand is growing, there might be some um, local forum or local website that is talking about you. Let's say Reddit, for example. Um, I'm sure that there's a subreddit that is all about beer and local markets. So if somebody is on Reddit talking about the, the beer scene in Denver, for example, and they post a link to your brewery and your website, and people start following that link and then visit your website, you'll be able to see that in analytics. So you may discover uh, websites where a conversation is happening and they link to your website. But if you want to try and find other locally relevant websites, um, Google AdWords has a tool within its display planner um, where you can actually do a little bit of research. and. Uh, with the keyword tool and then this um, other tool where you can find locally relevant websites, they actually took the ability away to get to that page um, without having an AdWords account. So in theory, you would have to have an AdWords account, but then maybe just not actually have any active campaigns. Um, just make sure anything is paused that you might be running. So then once you sign up for an account, you can use these tools to, to do a little bit of research and find some of these locally relevant websites. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's that's a really good point that um, that Google um, AdWords does provide some amazing tools to kind of find um, websites that that potentially will have targeted traffic for your ads. Um, but that's exactly right. You do just you need to sign up for an account before you're going to get access to the tools. Um, you know, the other thing that I would say is you just doing going in and just googling. So you know, go at like you you know, ideally if you. Um, I don't know where you're located, Christian, off the top of my head, but um, you know, doing some searches around craft brewing and your city name or, you know, just kind of more um, localized search terms and going into Google and seeing what comes up. I mean, you know, there might be directories and um, these sites that are going to come up where it would really behoove you to, to be on those websites. So that's another great way um, to kind of tell, you know, or find websites that are, have high visibility for those keywords in the area that you're trying to, to reach. Um, so here's a great one. Um, are there any SEM SEO trends on the mobile front that might be ap applicable to the craft brew landscape? Wow, that's a great one. Any, yeah, any so um, I think, you know, if you are, for example, going to be running um, a brew pub and a restaurant with, with the brewery, um, I think one of the great things about mobile traffic um, and, and mobile advertising is that you can actually get really specific um, in terms of some of your features and how you target that audience. So you can say, um, okay, I'm going to target a mobile phone, um, you know, a mobile user, and if they are within a very close um, radius within my business, let's say it's with, uh, within like two miles, um, I'm going to bid a little bit higher for uh, on that person than, let's say, somebody who is uh, 20 miles away. So you're going to actually get a little bit more aggressive for people who are closer towards your location or maybe searching for your particular location if somebody is in one particular uh, side of town. So you can get really specific um, in that sense. And it even happens um, on SEO, and you may not even realize it. So one of the things, um, one of the big changes uh, over the last year or so with just organic search and local search in general and mobile phones is uh, an algorithm update for Google called um, Hummingbird, which it's not necessarily an algorithm update, but it's more of the processing update to how it takes uh, information in about where users located and what devices that they're using. So um, the, the big example that I like to use is you know, a few, you know, four or five years ago, uh, SEO might be more focused on keywords and searching for, okay, Portland pizza restaurant. That might be something that you include in your title tags and on your website, things like that. But now, with Siri on iPhone and uh, Google voice search, it's so easy to just pick up your phone and say, okay, uh, what's the best pizza place near me? So search engines are actually, Google especially, is smarter at recognizing 
um, okay, what's the best? They understand that the term best means something with a high rating. It's, it, it's, it's well known. It's got a high rating. So they'll take a look at those local business listings and they'll find um, a restaurant that might have 80 reviews and four and a half out of five stars. So then they can take the word pizza and know that that's the type of food that you're looking for. And then when you say near me, it actually understands that near is a location and me is the user. So it will actually sort of hack it, not hack in, but it'll use your phone and GPS and its coordinates to say, okay, I'm in this spot in town and two blocks away there is a pizza restaurant that has five out of five stars with 100 reviews. So that's going to be your top search result. <clears throat> so there's ways to target it on paid search, but then just having a, a strong presence with reviews and ratings um, and a really popular um, listing can help out on the SEO side as well. Great. Um, good, good, good. Good question, you guys. And I'm hoping that we're answering um, most of them here. Let's see. Uh, this is so a question on bidding. I just want to speak to this one. Um, from Brian, for a young business, business that's focused on building awareness, can it be beneficial to bid on search terms um, their competitors might be using, i.e. searching for a competitor's brand name? Um, and Alex, I know you typed in your answer, but I, I think yes, that it can be um, a, a, a good um, strategy. And do you want to speak to that a little bit, Alex? Yeah, so you can, you know, definitely within like AdWords or, you know, the Bing Ads Network, you definitely have the option of bidding on branded terms. Um, and you can test that to see if, how effective it is. Um, but I think definitely in sort of like the restaurant local business space, um, the example that I pulled up with Yelp is that if you're going to advertise on Yelp, you get to have your ad appear on other Yelp listings and nobody can bid on, you know, nobody can appear on your own listing. So um, I think it's definitely something to at least worth testing if that's something that interests you, but it is an option. Um, and, it, you know, just depending on, um, you know, again, what your goals are and what you're trying to sell, it may or may not work. Yeah, I've, I've seen another interesting um, tactic that I've seen for something like that. So um, if you wanted to, say, get to try and gain, gain some organic traction, depending on how big the, the brand is and how um, and how hard, it, you know, how, how many people are competing for that term or I guess how optimized your competitor is, you could, I've seen some um, kind of creative ways where you can maybe do a blog post if you have a blog, like, you know, what are the top, how are the top, the top five ways that we're different from X competitor, right? You can be playful and be like, hey, we're not like these guys because we're this. And, and by putting your competitor's brand name on the blog post, sometimes it can, like, you can actually rank for your competitor's term and, and, and showing how you're different, which could be a really compelling post for someone that might be looking I get your competitor, but like, whoa, who are these guys? So um, there are a lot of really kind of fun, playful, creative things that you can do to start um, gaining some traction, especially, like you say, you're young, you don't know, not that many people know about you, and if a lot of people know about this other um, craft brewery brand, then absolutely capitalizing on that could, I think, could be an effective strategy. Yeah, and then one of the things to be aware of is, depending on the brand, um, you, can, you can bid on those terms, um, but depending on the brand and how you know powerful they are and their lawyers and things like that, um, if it's a trademarked term, you might not be able to actually have that trademark term in the ad itself. So I don't know if something like Smirnoff, um, you know, if they're pretty aggressive about going after people who have Smirnoff in their ad. That's not Smirnoff uh, using Google AdWords, but you can bid on Smirnoff as a keyword. You just can't mention it anywhere in your ad. Right, exactly. I, that, that is exactly right. Um, so uh, here's a question from Pat. In a market with only one or two other competitors, are there platforms that work more efficient locally? So, Pat, are you talking about platforms to serve paid advertising, maybe? Um, I think that's how I'm reading that question. So maybe which, which which advertising networks or platforms, yes, paid. So she's wanting to know, in a market with only one or two other competitors, are there paid platforms that work more efficient locally? Yeah, I mean, I think if you are in a pretty small um, market, you know, it might be a small town or, you know, whatever geographically, um, I, I think the same platforms would apply to some, someone bigger like Los Angeles. Um, it's just really now, you know, you might be able to get to use a slightly smaller budget. Um, 
and then you you might be able to use Facebook more towards um, you know getting things uh, you know getting things like events and things like that towards greater awareness. Um, I, I think what's nice is that if there's not a lot of competition, that you probably don't have to spend as much, and people are already aware of your name. So then it might be just some things on the side. It might be a particular event or um, some you know something else. Like let's say you're launching a line of T-shirts. Um, I I think the types of platforms that you can use are still going to apply. You just don't get to have to worry so much about a lot of budget and a lot of competitiveness in that case. Great. Awesome, Alex. So um, Chad is asking, is there a way to search Google for websites, users, or traffic that relate to your brand, target customers, and core concepts? Yes. Um, I believe um, – so Google and other search engines um, accept some of those more advanced search operators like Boolean search. So for one example of that would be um, if you were to go to Google and you were to type in, um, this is just a really broad example, let's say it's Obama, and that's the keyword that you use. And then you do Obama site colon CNN.com it's only going to give you search results from CNN that have to do with Obama. So that's the, the very, very broad approach. But you can take that and you can also do the negative. So if you were to do, um, you know, Oregon Brewing and then you do minus site colon your website, it would, it would surface um, content and pages that have to do with brewing in Oregon but it's going to exclude your own website. So that's one way that you can use some of that and find some things that are similar but sort of exclude you so that those search results don't count your, your content and your search results. Um, so that's one way to do it. Great. I would also just echo back. I think that what it used to be called the Google Ad Planner, which was that tool that we were just talking about, um, that when you set up an AdWords account, you can go in, and it's, it's pretty robust in that you can enter all sorts of different interests and, and keywords, and it'll come up with a list of, you know, of potentially hundreds of websites that would be extremely relevant for those interests. So that's another tool um, uh, that I would recommend as well. So I want to move on. Oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll actually just answer that one uh, one more time. So another really effective way to sort of get an understanding of what your audience is and who they like is you can use Facebook to find some of this same information. So advertising on Facebook one of the ways to advertise on Facebook is different in that it's not based off of keywords. It's more based off um, the, the end user. So the audience that you're trying to target, what do they like? What, pay, what other pages on Facebook do they like? So when you're going through the process of creating an ad, you get to the option where, okay, I want to target people who like these pages. And so then you can start typing in different keywords, and it actually pulls up all of the different pa all of the different um, pages and Facebook groups, things like that, that have to do with that keyword. And so that's where you can target. So even if you're not ready to launch Facebook advertising, you can just go through the process, and when you get to that option, you can see all of the different Facebook groups and Facebook pages that have to do with that concept, um, and it kind of helps identify a little bit more about who, what that audience likes. That's a great tip, Alex. Um, so here's a question from Ben. This is a good one, I think. Can you talk about your process of revamping an existing company's website and digital marketing plan? So it sounds like um, you're redoing, Ben. You might be redoing an existing website, yep, and you want to kind of know, talk about the process um, around that. And that's, that's, that's a hard, it's a hard thing to do, so good question. Yeah, so I think... Um you know, I, you know, if you've had a website pre up previously um, and you have the benefit of, like, Google Analytics data, start there um, and start saying, like, what was your most, what was your most popular content um, if you had a lot of pages on the website or you had a blog, for example. Um, definitely start looking at your traffic information if you had Google Analytics installed on that previous website. Um, there's definitely some tool, there's some other tools out there where um, what it can do is it can simulate um, sort of tracking like where somebody might look on a web page um, or where their um, mouse scroll might look at, and that kind of gives you a little bit of a usability sense. Um, and so then, you, you know, you can either do that by actually uploading URL um, if you have sort of like a staging version of your website, um, 
or you can upload an image, and so then it kind of takes a, an algorithmic approach to that image and saying, okay, this might be the most likely areas that somebody is paying attention to. Um, but then what you can also do is definitely take a look at all of your social media channels. Um, and if you find that you have a lot of activity on Facebook, that definitely helps you sort of plan out, okay, I'm going to continue to focus on Facebook. I'm going to make Facebook a big part of the website. Um, and then if you have some sort of staging website or, um, you know, some a new website that's up and running, you might be able to use some tools like Fiverr to um, get some other people online just to take a look at your website. And you can say, okay, I'm going to hire, for, for super, super cheap, I'm going to hire 100 people to navigate my website, and I'm going to ask them, can you purchase a product easily? Um, and they don't necessarily have to go through the process, but you can get sort of that user experience and say, okay, I'm going to hire some people to test out my site. And it might be just a few dollars, um, depending on some of those tools like Fiverr and things like that. But definitely usability is something to take into consideration as well. What is, is that? Is it Fiverr.com? Do you have a quick URL for that tool? That sounds like a great one. Just yeah, while, you're, while you're looking for that link, um, so I have a few other, a few additional suggestions too, Ben. Um, so one thing that I've worked with companies that you want to make sure that you do, if you haven't already, when you, if, if your existing site is up and you're going to be soon to launch a new site. Oh, thank you so much, Alex. There it is, Fiverr. Um, so you want, I would say definitely get a web, a, a Google um, Webmaster Tools account and a Google Analytics account. They're both free, and, you, and install those. If you don't have them set up, set them up immediately, and um, kind of let the old site kind of start um, getting some aggregated aggregate data, especially Google Webmaster Tools, because what it will do is it will then help you know which um, pages of your current website are ranking organically, so that when you do end up launching your new site, you just really want to make sure that all those pages that already have organic rankings, if there are any, are going to redirect to appropriate new pages, um, because if they don't, then they're going to throw some 404, 404 errors and create a bad user experience, which Google doesn't like. So um, I would just be very careful, careful on making sure that um, you kind of found all the pages of your current site that are highly visible, that are bringing you traffic. Um, make sure that those are going to kind of redirect and have nice landing pages on the new site and take care of that. That's something that I have found a lot of clients tend to overlook or forget about. And, you know, a week after a launch, there's like, oh, shit, we, you know, we have this 404 error that's being thrown on the first page of Google for this or whatever. So, um, so Google Webmaster Tools and Google Analytics, those are the tools will help you kind of figure that out beforehand. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, I want to take. I want to go back to social. So I, I'm going to kick off this part, of, and I'm going to go back to the. We had some uh, check-in questions. We'll get to in a moment. But I want you to talk to us, um, Alex, just about. So there is just you know tons of stuff going on with paid opportunities on social. We've already talked a little bit about them, but I want you to just kind of give us an overview. Can you like um, kind of what are the main players with social paid advertising? Um, you know. What has the success been like? Um, just kind of give us the overview from your perspective and, and where you think it's where, where it's heading right now. Yeah, so if you're looking at different social media platforms, um, obviously one of the top ones is probably going to be Facebook. Um, and there's a couple options that you have with Facebook. You get the traditional um, marketplace ads, which are the ones that you see along the right-hand sidebar um, to the right of your news feed. Um, those probably might not work as well um, because you do get sort of a smaller image. Um, you get a little bit of text. Um, it's more like a display ad. You're probably going to have pretty low click-through rates for that. Um, but the other side that Google is really starting to, or I mean, Facebook is pushing more towards is actually like sp is sponsoring your content. So one of the one of the biggest gripes with Facebook, and it's kind of like a, a growing complaint is that if I have a Facebook page for my brewery um, and I'm going to publish something, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a status update and I'm going to send a link to um, our latest beer or an event that we're going to be having. If I just do a regular update um, and send that to my Facebook page, that organic reach of that content is not going to be seen by 100% of your fans. Because some of them may have liked your page two years ago and don't even use Facebook anymore. Some of them just don't log in on a daily basis. So by the time they do log in, things are, uh, you know, there's more popular things. Uh, Facebook is really starting to push more towards um, surfacing uh, better search results uh, for, for uh, 
one example within the newsfeed is um, with memes, you know, like the classic meme of some some image and then the text over it and it's kind of funny or quirky. That as a meme, um, almost every single business Facebook page started using memes to try and sort of ride the bandwagon and things like that and make their Facebook page funny. Um, but it started to be too much. So Facebook actually as an algorithm started targeting memes specifically and said, okay, if, if all your status updates are going to have a meme on it, your page is we're actually going to sort of downgrade the rank of your Facebook page, and that post is not going to be seen by as many people. So you oh. definitely want to have a post that has great content. It's got some really great actual photos. Maybe it's an entire photo gallery or a video, um, but it's still not going to be seen by 100% of your fans. So Facebook actually tries to get you to pay that content, unfortunately, to people who are already your fans, in addition to people who might not like your page yet. It's kind of a hard reality um, that Facebook is making you do that, but obviously they have to make money just kind of like, you know, they have to make money just like AdWords. Um, so you may have to pay to get that post seen by more people. And depending on what the post is, um, if it's just a random update on a, a Friday afternoon and you post a photo of a beer in someone's hand with your great weather outside, you're probably not going to pay to get that to, to be seen by more people. But if you're trying to promote an event or a new product, um, that might be something that you're going to pay to get more people on Facebook to see. Um, Twitter has an advertising platform. So, you know, if, if, if you've done a little bit of audience research and you know that, um, you know, your customers and your audience is big on Twitter, um, you can target uh, relevant hashtags on Twitter. So if there is a hashtag that's really popular um, and it might be something that's locally relevant, um, you know, you might be able to get a paid tweet within that uh, part, you know, within that hashtag, within that content, that conversation that everybody's talking about. Um, and then one of the other ones that can be pretty relevant is Foursquare. Mm -hmm. So Foursquare has, uh, is, is expanding its um, advertising platform. And there's two main ways that it, you can target on Foursquare. One is people who are searching for a particular restaurant um, or a related product. So if I'm looking to, you know, if I'm looking for something on dinner on my on my Foursquare app, you know, you might be able to have an ad that shows up um, for your restaurant or your brew pub uh, based off what someone is searching for. And then it's also based off of similar check-ins. So if I check into a restaurant that's not a brewery, um, I might be able to target that check-in with um, a, a particular beer or a particular brew pub that might be close by. Uh, one example that Foursquare itself used um, when, it when it first launched its advertising, advertising platform, um, and I think when it first launched, it was just closed to people, you know, brands that were accepted in, certain, in terms of its sort of beta processing. But the example that they used is I check into a bar or a club, whatever, and when I check in, um, the ad was um, a liquor ad. I think it might have been Schmiernoff or, um, no, it's Captain Morgan's. That was the example in Foursquare's announcement where I'm going to check into a bar and Captain Morgan's is going to have an ad that shows up after my check-in. Um, and, and, and so the only thing, the thing with Foursquare is that you only pay when somebody takes an action. So they click on the ad um, and they get, maybe it's like a coupon or something. So Foursquare can be another one as well. And actually, that, let's jump back. So that takes me, there are a few check-in questions back here. You get that we skipped over. So I'm just going to read those out. So John is asking about, I think, tracking check-ins um, for an app like Untapped, and the question does a similar thing work for Untapped. So I think he was um, wondering, and, and my experience, John, has been in terms of tracking um, kind of check-ins, typically what, whatever the individual social media platform is, so whether it's an app like Untapped or whether it's um, Yelp or whether it's Foursquare, like all of those platforms, or Facebook, they all have their own insight, like analytics dashboard. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a pain in the ass, so you're going to have all these different, you know, typically pieces to pull together different you know, different analytics 
Um, but that typically has, has been my experience. Google Analytics has some capability to track referral traffic. So if you know if some if one of these sites is sending traffic to your site, you can measure that. But like something like a check-in that stays on the app or the or the social website won't be tracked through through Google Analytics. Um, and then Josie asked a question: Would you suggest that customers check in? Um, to your um, brewery, and I would say absolutely. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, that can definitely be something um, because one, you know, you get to target people. Um, definitely with Foursquare, you know, if if you have a, a verified Foursquare profile, you get to see those insights about who has checked in, who are who has checked in the most often, and you can actually reward people for checking in. So it's definitely a way to. Um, build loyalty and build brand awareness and build fans of your brew pub or restaurant or distillery, what have you. Um, as a promotion, um, it's that is something that you can do. I believe um, if you're looking on like Foursquare or Yelp on a mobile app, I believe that when you are looking at the results, and let's say I'm on Yelp and I'm looking at the um, you know pizza category, that's I keep going back to pizza probably because I'm hungry, but um, you know, if you're looking at the pizza category, I believe those search results, if if that particular restaurant is doing a deal at the moment for like a check-in deal, I believe that that actually does appear within the search results. So it might actually entice someone to go there. Um, yeah. But then you might also yeah. get some promotions yeah. and you get rewards based off of, okay, check in 10 times and then you get, you know, $5 off your next order. Just depends on what, what the features are within the platform. Yeah, and absolutely. So Chad, creating a, a special check-in offer um, on Foursquare, there, there are special kind of tags that, that um, if you have a promotion, you can see kind of that will absolutely help build some awareness. So, so in, you know, in, in figuring out a way to incite people to check in is great. And another huge benefit of having folks check in um, is that not only then are you, you know it's that you're then basically marketing to all of their friends. So you know I have whatever 300, 400 friends, I don't know however many on Foursquare that are getting you know that see when I check in somewhere close to them. So if you assume that if I'm like a hard cider gal and I go to your place and I'm drinking some great hard cider and I check in, all my 400 friends who typically might have the same interests as me, you know, hand, you know, might they like probably like cider too. Now all of a sudden get to see your brand as well. So it's a really great way to kind of play that whole friends of a friend um, kind of power, you know, the social networking power. So I, you know, absolutely check-ins. That being said, you know, and this is the novelty of the check-in is definitely wearing off, right? Check-ins were super hot, I don't know how many years ago, and I think the novelty is wearing thin a little bit. Um, but it certainly is a, if, if you have someone who's checking in regularly, definitely reward and recognize that behavior would be my would be my suggestion. Um, do you want to do you have a follow-up thought to that, Alex? Oh, no, no, we're good. Okay, so I do want to make sure we get to Instagram. So um, we have uh, Diorella, what a pretty name, or um, Africa Diorella asking about what uh, what about Instagram. So Alex, I, I don't, as far as I know, um, think that Instagram has, have they just launched a paid platform, do you know, Alex? They did launch one um, within the last six months or so. But I believe that one is still sort of on um, sort of like a beta mode right now. So um, it, I believe Pinterest is still on a beta mode. So the example of that would be, OK, I'm an in interested advertiser. I have to contact Instagram or I have to contact um, Pinterest to say, like, I would like to, to advertise on your platform. Um, and then they can approve you or not. I'm actually going to look this up really quick. Well, um, yeah. Looking that up, I'll just say that um, you know whether or not you can pay to play on Instagram. I think Instagram is a great organic. Like I would definitely well, and I hate I, I hate to say I would definitely anything in this business because that's that's dangerous. But um, I think if you do the research and find out that your target is out on Instagram, then I think Instagram is a, is a is a good medium for you guys to work in because you have 
You have like fun, like com compelling, like images that you can take of what you're doing. Um, it's a very visual uh, thing, crap brewing. So I think Instagram would be a really great platform for you guys. You can be playful, you can be whimsical. Um, my experience around Instagram is that your demographic for my of it is there, you know. Um, so I would say yes, definitely consider Instagram as as uh, a place where you might want to represent your brand. Um, and here's a really good. Uh, so I'm just going to add, Ken, since Foursquare. Since Foursquare can connect with your Facebook account, do you have to pay to promote for both sites, or does promoting the ad on Foursquare cross over to Facebook? Um, so that's a good. They are separate. So the pay the pay campaigns are separate, and I don't believe that when you're advertising on there are there are shareable elements around. For, so for example, if you promote if you have a promotion or are inciting someone to check in on Foursquare, it may, they make it so easy for that person to share that to Facebook. So you are kind of getting a byproduct, you know, kind of placement on Facebook just because I, as a user, have opted to share my Foursquare check-in on Facebook, which I do 90% of the time. Um, but you're not you're not paying for that necessarily. Um, and I think those two platforms currently are pretty separate. So if you wanted to run a paid campaign on Foursquare and Facebook, they'd be two separate things. Yeah, and um, so that's true. Uh, one last thing about Foursquare. Um, and this is something that just happened within the last like week and a half, and um, I haven't had a chance to dig in and see what the ramifications are on its advertising. But Foursquare actually split into two separate apps. So Foursquare itself is now more sort of like a search function, um, where you know you might be able to search for a particular um, type of food or type of restaurant, type of brewery, a local business. And you see the search results and you see, um, you know, you can now leave ratings on Foursquare and you can get re some little quick reviews, things like that, a little bit more like Yelp. Um, and then the actual check-in part of Foursquare is now separate. And that's an app called Swarm. So Foursquare has, has been kind of trying to find a way to evolve itself. Um, and, you know, I've read some articles over the past year or so about Foursquare um, that interviewed like the founders and things like that and at first they were all about the check-in and they did that primarily just to get all of this data about users um, and then after the check-in they introduced the ability to rate a business so now that's another piece of information about how successful a business is um, and then I think after that you know you can leave little short reviews so now that they have all this information that's where they built their own little search engine, um, and now that's Foursquare. And they've noticed that the actual check-in part has died, so I think that's why they split it off into its own separate app called Swarm. So the advertising part, I have not looked into the effects. Um, I would imagine that um, there's still the ability to advertise on both apps. So if I go to Swarm and I check into a bar, I assume I'm still going to see an ad for Captain Morgan's, um, but then on the actual Foursquare app, um, they may have expanded into, okay, I'm going to search for a particular type of restaurant, and then I can advertise on that search. Great. I want to talk about pricing. So we have a, um, a question here um, asking about the average pricing. Um, I think we, that was in reference to a Facebook advertisement. Um, I believe, find the exact question, wherever it went. It was back here a little bit. Um, um, yes, okay, so, so, so let's talk across the board. Um, let's talk a little bit about pricing in these social platforms, Facebook, um, and you know, the other social, and, and you can end with showing Google AdWords as well. So just give us an idea um, around pricing, Alex. Cost. Yeah, so it's, um, it's really going to, uh, it's actually, it, it, depending on, you know, how specific that you're getting, um, you know, what audience you're targeting and how big that audience is and how competitive that audience is, um, it, the CPCs and the average cost are really going to vary. So it's hard to give sort of an average number that might be industry wide. Um, but what is nice, especially with something like Facebook, is as you get into um, its platform and you're starting to build an, uh, build an ad, as you start refining your audience and saying, okay, I want to target people that like this page or, or um, I'm also going to target friends of friends that like my page, it actually gives you a live update of how much your estimated cost per click might be. So 
Excuse me. Um, so it's definitely hard to give sort of an average metric to that, but as you go into AdWords or as you go into Facebook, um, you're going to get some of those estimates there, and then you can make a decision about how much you can fit within your budget. It really does. There's a huge range, Pat. I would say, and you know, I mean, just being really, really generalizing, and, and Alex is right. It really depends a lot upon the terms that you want to bid on. But kind of just generally speaking, um, at Google AdWords, I think can be one of the most expensive platforms to advertise on. Um, because it's it's they own like eighty percent of the search traffic. Um, the the searchers are way down the funnel, i.e. they're not passive up here. Like you know, you go into a social media platform, you know, you know people there aren't necessarily searching for what you have to offer. They're not entering a keyword like local brew pub necessarily if they're in Facebook looking at their family photos. However, if they're in Google AdWords and they're looking for a local brew pub, they're going to put that in. So that's an active searcher versus a passive searcher. Um, Google AdWords charges a premium for active searchers because they're looking for you and, and you know you can target people that are looking for exactly what you have to offer. So it might, you know, that tends to be more expensive typically because it's proven that that might have a higher, a higher return on investment for you. However, like you jump over to social, that, and I don't want to say that social is cheap and easy because it absolutely isn't. You know, so I, I mean, back early on in the day, you know, Facebook ads were were comparatively inexpensive. Now the, the costs have jumped up quite a bit. So um, at, at the end of the day, like they they allow you to have a lot of control. So you could certainly play around and pilot, you know, a test budget of you know a hundred bucks or you know fifty bucks or whatever. You can certainly start as small as you want to, and it. And I think you can learn a lot, even with a small budget. It may not get you a lot of return, but you might be able to learn enough. It's like, hey, you know, if I bump up this 100 to 500, maybe I'll actually get, you know, 50 more people to come to my event, which could be significant for a small craft brew pub. So um, I think that's a lot of it is testing and just really know, you know, it's a really wide range when it comes to budget. That's a great question. Um, and there was another. Okay, this is a really good one, you guys. We have about five. We have five more minutes. I I can go a little bit over. We're, we're going to try and wrap up at seven here. But this is a great question for Mary. What about asking for ratings or stars or reviews along with the check-in? Is it effective, or is it a double-edged sword? And I'm going to just broaden that out because um, I think a lot of people ask, especially when ratings and reviews now are becoming so important, as Alex just spoke about, especially with mobile considerations. Like how you know what is the general best practice around inciting or trying to you know reward people for giving good reviews? And Alex, I'll let you speak to that. Yeah. So aside from paid search, I mean, it's definitely critical, especially if you're looking at a business listing on Google or Yelp or Foursquare, um, getting those reviews and getting those ratings um, and making sure that they're good is definitely something that's probably you know one of the most important things with local search. Um, but with with reviews and ratings, you have to be careful. So Yelp and Google, they are pretty smart at detecting when somebody is trying to incentivize that review. So if you have it actually sort of public on your website somewhere, like, oh, re you know, review us on Google and get $10 off your next order, you know, Google can crawl that, Yelp can crawl that, they can see that information and they're they're going to know that you're trying to incentivize it which is against their rules and likely on Yelp you're going to get those reviews um, hidden on uh, Yelp or you know um, Google might not show them either so definitely you don't want to publicly try to incentivize those I think the best way to go about um, you know encouraging people to leave reviews um, on on Yelp or Google Plus is to simply say, you know, check us out on Yelp or check us out on Google Plus. And if somebody had um, a really, really great time, they're more likely that they're going to leave a review for that. Now, if you have something like an email newsletter, um, which might be a little bit more private, again, you don't want to incentivize it within the email because even something like Google and Gmail, you know, they're crawling our email to, to, to serve ads to us within the Gmail platform. So I, I would assume that they can still crawl that email newsletter if you're trying to incentivize it. But email is something that's a little bit more private where you can say, okay, you know, check us out on Yelp, you know, leave us a review on Google+. Plus. Um, as, but as long as you don't try to incentivize it in any way, that you, you should be fine there. Um, 
but with ratings and with reviews, that's definitely something that you do want to focus on. And you and it starts with having a great product, with having great customer service, and those will naturally build up over time. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Um, and uh, you know, I, I it just yeah, reminds me very quick um, story. I was talking to a friend today who was trying to get had an app, and she was trying to get um, people to to review her app in the app store because that's super important to get good reviews for your apps. And she's like, you know, I sent all these influencers these gorgeous little you know boxes with blue tissue paper, and there was this invite to review the app, and it was really pretty. And she was talking about how gorgeous this little box was, and all the effort she went into sending these out. And I like, I just sat there like, but wait a minute, was the app any good? Like. How good was the app? Because really, that's what you needed to invest in. Nobody's going to review a shitty app, no matter what you send them in the mail. So I think the moral of that story is be the best. Like, you guys love what you do. Do the best beer you can. Make the best cider you can. Make your customers really, really happy. And then make it easy for them. Like, let them know that you're on these places. Just make it easy for them to review. But I would never directly ask. That's just me. Um, but yeah, good, really good advice, Alex. Um, so, Let's see here. Last call, everybody, it's 7 o'clock on the nose. Last call for questions. I'm just going to let you guys uh, give just a few minutes. I want to first, I want to thank Alex so much for being here. Alex, as always, um, this is the second time we've run this and the second time you've been here. You're a valued member of, of, of our course here, so we appreciate your time. And I appreciate every, every, all of you guys that showed up tonight. Um, a big, nice group of you. So thank you. Your questions make it awesome. And I'll be here one week from tonight um, at seven at six o'clock Pacific Standard Time for Tim Resnick from Moz.com, and we'll be talking more about digital strategy and organic website optimization stuff. So hopefully I'll see you guys see you guys then. All right, I think we're good. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful week, you guys. Don't hesitate to post your questions if you have any. Um,